Crawley. I'm a veterinary officer at Biosecurity at PERSA. Um, I've been involved in the Alicia Canis um, surveillance in South Australia. My background is in biomedical research and then small animal um, clinical practice. And I've also worked in Indigenous communities and um, developing countries in dog health management programs. So today I'm just going to run through a new um, sickness that we've found or has been detected in Australia. Um, loosely called tick sickness or um, also known as Lichia canis and what's happening in South Australia. So I'm just going to give you an overview of what it is, how is it transmitted, a bit of background about the Australian outbreak, what are the signs of the disease, how to diagnose it and then prevention. Um, now so what is a lichiosis and it's um, Pretty easy to pronounce once you break it up. So that's just the sounding there, Ehrlichiosis. Um, it's actually a little bacteria um, called Ehrlichia canis, and it lives in the blood cells um, inside infected dogs. And in this picture below, you can see the sort of the smaller um, gray pink circles or blobs are red blood cells and the larger, um, more purple cells with varying shapes, they are white blood cells. And then you can see in the red um, oval um, marker, um, two dark purple blobs, and they're actually what they call morulae, and they're due to the Ehrlichia canis bacteria. And it shows that this um, dog is infected on this blood smear. They're pretty hard to detect on blood smears, but occasionally can be seen. So how is ehrlichiosis transmitted? Uh, it's what we call a tick-borne disease um, and it's specifically spread by brown dog ticks. So no other ticks can spread it. it. has to be brown dog ticks which are the majority of the ticks that will attach to a dog. Um, there's um, a few other species but um, they're pretty rare. Um, the scientific name of the tick is Ripicephalus linnaei, um, formerly sanguineus. And the important thing to remember is that ehrlichiosis cannot be transmitted directly from dog to dog. You need a tick for that transmission to occur. So you need the, um, it's only transmitted through the bite of an infected tick, um, which is actually carrying the bacteria. And that's at all life cycle stages of the tick. Um, some of which when they're tiny baby larva are really hard to see. So where has Ehrlichia canis been detected over the world? Um, you can see the red patches uh, where it's been detected. Um, they're positive um, detections. The green patches are where it's not known to be found. Um, there's been samples and it's never been found and the grey patches uh, where it's never been tested or reported. So you can see that Australia um, is um, up until April last year was um, had no history of having um, Ehrlichia canis um, being present in the country and also um, imported animals were actively screened to um, check that they weren't carrying the disease um, before they came into Australia. So what happened last year was a astute vet in Kununurra um, just saw increasing numbers of dogs with unusual clinical signs and nothing quite added up. Um, their dogs had severe bleeding disorders, fever, enlarged spleens, swelling, they could get cloudy eyes and then um, they um, often died and they tested for a few known tick related diseases um, and they were negative like Babesia and Anaplasma um, and they would have checked a few other things but um, eventually they sent samples to get screened further to the National Laboratory at Geelong and they detected um, Ehrlichia canis. So here you can see the map of um, Australia with sort of a big red patch over it. Um, 
So this is the known sort of range of the disease now um, since surveillance has been performed in WANT and South Australia. Um, Queensland, um, we don't know what's, how far it spreads into Queensland. Obviously, the ticks don't stop at the border. Um, there's not been any surveillance performed in those remote regions in Queensland. So um, there's been over 500 lab confirmed laboratory cases um, by June of this year. However, there's been many, many more visual reports. Um, and you have to remember um, that there's limited surveillance capacity in remote regions. Um, and we expect that the number of cases is into the thousands by now. So, and ACT is now the only state or territory not to have any um, detections. Um, all the other states like New South Wales, Victoria, um, Tasmania, um, have had um, imported cases that have been um, infected in this somewhere in these red regions um, and then traveled to these states. So what are the clinical signs of ehrlichiosis in dogs? Um, it's worth just, if you have working dogs um, or are talking to people, this is worth um, just being familiar with. Um, fever, which you may not notice, but you'll see if your dog is lethargic or tired and also not eating. Um, and as time goes on, they um, get weight loss. Um, initially they get gummy um, sore eyes and then later on this can um, change into this hazy blue cloudy eyes and blindness that you can see in this dog here um, and you can also see that this dog is quite thin over the um, flanks and back um, and in a sort of more chronic stage there's nose bleeds and other bleeding and they can sometimes have swelling of the limbs and under the jaw so there's different stages to this disease and I just want to step through this with you. So what happens to infected dogs? Um, and if we start in the top left-hand corner where you can see the tick with um, three little bacteria inside it, um, a dog is bitten by a tick carrying a lichia canis. So then it, um, there's a very high likelihood it will be infected. Um, and then the dog enters an acute phase. Um, and this is usually two to four weeks after the tick bite. Um, the dog exhibits, um, is lethargic, doesn't want to eat. It may show some bleeding um, because the platelets, which are the um, things that plug up um, bleeding inside your bloodstream, um, get um, knocked about and get very low levels of those. Um, and yeah, I think we said fever. And this is the time when um, if the dog is presented to a vet um, and tested and tested positive, this is the time when um, treatment may be successful. And treatment is 28 days of um, an antibiotic biotic called doxycycline. Um, it's retested. Um, that might need to go uh, be treated further. There's some a few other medications that the dog may need. Um, and then the dog may fully recover, which is the blue box on the far right. However, you'll notice the arrow between treatment um, and down to the subclinical phase. The dogs may actually, either without treatment, um, or some dogs don't respond well to treatment, um, can progress to a subclinical phase where they look fine. Um, you won't notice, um, but the bacteria is still inside the dog um, and it hides in the bone marrow and the spleen um, and they can still have the low platelet levels um, and um, sometimes other bone marrow problems, but you probably wouldn't notice um, there being any problems. Um, and then some animals, we don't know how many, uh, what proportion then progress to what we call the final chronic um, terminal phase. Um, and this is when the bone marrow is destroyed and um, uh, because of the bacteria. So it's, it's um, 
uh, basically like a failed bone marrow transplant, there's bone marrow fa failure, um, they get infections, um, a lot of bleeding, and there's a very high mortality is basically um, untreatable. So that little box popped up saying early treatment has the greatest chance of cure. So that's one of my take home messages to you. If you suspect your dog or a friend's dog has um, a lichia canis, um, you need to go and get your dog checked um, because that's your best chance of a cure is early on in the disease. So how is it diagnosed? Um, Basically, we would sort of, or the vet would look at that you take it to, would look at the clinical signs, whether there's a history of travel to um, those positive regions that I showed you on the map before, um, and whether there's been a history of exposure to ticks. Um, and then blood samples need to be taken, and these are sent to either Geelong or Darwin. Um, and what it there's two tests that are done. One is a PCR, which um, actually um, um, looks at the bacterial genetic material uh, to see whether that's present in the blood. And the other is antibodies um, to the bacteria. And um, so you need to have both tested, which the vet would know. And it's the vet's responsibility if they suspect um, that your dog or a dog has um, a lichia canis because it's a notifiable disease. It needs to be reported to um, the state government, um, the correct state government. Um, so where are brown dog ticks found? Um, there's been a few old publications and then there was a um, newer publication back in, uh, just in 2020 where you can see these red dots. Um, where they looked um, and, and, and detected the um, brown dog tick. We've, we've found uh, there's other maps which aren't published where the brown dog tick basically has been found pretty much all over South Australia, uh, right down on the south coast of Western Australia. Um, I can't say specifically about Victoria or New South Wales, but the, um, the tick distribution, distribution map um, in the, with a red dotted line sort of wiggling across Australia is um, just shows you where they think the climatic conditions and the presence of the tick will support all year round um, life cycle of the tick. Um, in other regions, um, the tick may be able to su survive under specific conditions, um, but sort of in the wild, so to speak, um, it would be um, above this dotted line. So we have actually detected the tick um, and positive cases throughout the APY lands. Um, and we had ticks as far south as Sejuna and um, Maralinga, Port Augusta. Um, so we've actually suggest that this um, potential tick and Alicia canis distribution is further south and, and um, is probably somewhere around these this pink sort of overlay um, are the sort of the regions where we think um, it's at high risk of infection where the ticks can be supported long term. Um, but you have to remember that there's ticks, uh, there's dogs carrying ticks that travel to other regions and. Um, so we don't know how well established the ticks can survive further south and um, whether they can bring infection further south. It's a big question mark that we'll, uh, in time, we'll know the answer to. So it's the tick um, is widespread in northern Australia, um, but the biggest thing I think I just alluded to before was the tick is very adaptable to households and warm conditions and shelter. So that's our concern about um, places further south. Um, the ticks need humidity um, to survive and warmth um, and they certainly um, like um, you know, town type of conditions, um, ha habitation. Um, so they may um, 
spread further south. So just a couple of slides on types of prevention um, and what is effective for Ehrlichia canis. And this is really important actually, because not every medication, again, that's used for ticks um, will work um, and prevent Ehrlichia canis infection. So there's, the best one is a repellent. So I call it a tick repel and kill. And there's only two effective products. There's a Ceresto collar um, that lasts for four months for ticks and eight months for fleas. And there's also Advantix Spot. And that's a monthly application. And that is just distributed around the out on the fur of the dog and kills the ticks um, before they have a chance to bite. So it stops the ticks even biting your dog. And this is really important to remember, my second take home message. Um, the second type of tick prevention is what I call a tick kill control product. Um, and the only effective ones are from the isoxazoline chemical family. Um, and they mostly come in twos. I think there's one spot on. Um, and but the thing to remember is they will not stop the ticks biting and they take um, at least three hours to kill new ticks um, and there's been published studies that they don't um, stop transmission of Ehrlichia canis infection so dogs um, will get infected if you just have them on this type of medication so um, the various redosing duration for each different product, but there's four different sorts that belong to this family. And you might be familiar with those um, with um, treating your own dog. So how would I protect my dog? So in high risk areas, so this is where I know that ticks are present and Ehrlichia canis infection is present. Um, so basically in Northern Australia, going back to that map, I would have my dog with a collar or spot on, a Ceresto collar or spot on, um, plus um, an isoxazoline, um, just uh, if I was going to live up there, um, to try and kill an, um, any stray ticks in the environment. In low risk areas, um, and Port Augusta may be considered if there's not, nobody ever really sees ticks there, um, then you might consider that a low risk area. We've been classing that as a higher risk um, just because of the possibility of dogs being imported from um, communities further north. You would just need to use either a tick, a tick repel product of some. Um, description, either the collar or the spot on. So in communities um, further north, um, it's impractical to ha use collars and spot ons regularly. And I think the approach is to, um, where possible, um, is to use um, isoxazoline based products to suppress the tick population. Um, other things are keep grass short and check your dog for ticks um, regularly. Um, and just a note that um, ivermectins don't effectively um, prevent um, ticks attaching. Um, you might think that they do everything, um, but they don't um, help with ticks. And um, you just need to be mindful of other parasite control needs if um, You've got to be um, watching out for sheep measles or um, hydatids or um, something like that. You'll need to make sure that um, your dog is treated specifically for these other things. So my key messages um, for anybody with a dog is take your dog to the vet early if you suspect ehrlichiosis. And it is sometimes difficult to treat in dogs, um, particularly if you, it's in that middle stage or the late stage of disease. And only a repellent product, um, the collar or spot on, will stop tick bites and therefore stop infection. So if you're in an area with ticks, use a repellent plus an isoxazoline product. 
and also just remembering that further south, if you don't really think there are ticks, um, just be mindful that ticks are very adaptable to indoor conditions and shelter. So if you've got animals with ticks coming in, um, ticks may get established um, further south. So in terms of um, wild dogs and dingoes, um, we don't think that, we currently think um, that only dingoes associated with um, communities are at a higher risk. Um, so communities where positive um, infection has been detected. Um, and again, also wild dogs would be the same if they're associated with um, habitation, human habitation. It's pretty unlikely that um, the ticks will become established uh, if the ticks would be coming established out bush, um, so to speak. Um, you really need that um, human habitation, but we're um, just watching this space just to to see how things are progressing. I just chatted with a vet up in Broome the other day and he was saying that um, a dog is at much greater risk in Broome as opposed to out on the road. Um, where dogs normally are very sparsely found. So um, I think it is a low risk that wild dogs and dingoes will introduce um, uh, the infection um, onto your property. Um, but if you know that ticks are around on your dogs, um, uh, you would be very, very wise, uh, your dogs are valuable, you would be very, very wise to um, regularly use a tick repellent product at an absolute minimum. Um, so we've done various um, communications um, on Facebook and Instagram and to vets and um, RSPCA and places like that, some animal shelters. Um, but um, it's challenging to be able to reach everyone. So we've got, um, this is our latest um, poster that um, was taken north and posted up on the road um, between um, Port Augusta and Alice Springs at various points along the road. Um, and we do have a website. Um, with more information there, uh, which you can see at the bottom of the page. Um, but right at the bottom of this page um, is the actual web link. And if you just Google Persa and ticks, um, you should find more information there. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, Bonnie Cumming from AMRIC and Peter Irwin at Murdoch um, for kindly allowing me to use a number of their slides in this presentation and also um, Bob Irving and Stefan Raynau who um, were integral to the surveillance project across APY lands um, and then my colleagues at PERSA, Celia, Sarah and Jane um, who've been involved in um, the surveillance um, for this disease and I'll end it there. Thank you, Alison. That was very informative. Now, I have a few questions. Okay. So hopefully we'll cover most of what the landholders would ask. Yeah, I hope so, yeah. Because <laughs> third time lucky we finally got through it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, how do you check your dog for ticks at all stages of the life cycle? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the adult engorged ticks should be fairly easy to find. You just run your fingers through the, the fur across particularly the back of the neck um, and on the head in the little cavities in the ears between the dog's paws, uh, like toes um, under the pads. Uh, they're sort of the ticks like little crevices. Um, and so when we were in the communities just, roughing up a dog, just sort of scratching it across its neck and around its neck, we were picking up quite big engorged ones. The larva, um, the first stage, or I think there's a larva and then a nymph, um, the larva are really tiny. I was a bit shocked when I realised how small they were. 
So um, I think probably just slightly bigger than a pinhead. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was a bit concerned after I heard that, uh, read that. So I think you just have to be looking closely through the fur. So, yeah. Yeah. Is there a time of year that you need to be more vigilant with ticks, particularly in the arid zone? Um, we think in the APY region, certainly when we went out for surveillance, it was September and then November. Um, and it was just starting to warm up in November and we were seeing certainly dogs with tick burdens through the APY lands. Um, but it's just those warmer months. I'd, I'd sort of say October through to, I don't know, March, April, probably. Yeah. Like yeah. Um, you guys would probably have a bit more of a feel for if you've got an animal um, up north or sort of when it's starting to warm up. Um, yeah. I don't think the ticks like the cold. Yeah. Okay. And are there any restrictions on movements of dogs across borders between states? Uh, no, basically. Um, the, your, uh, the letter of the law is uh, dogs should be healthy. And if you knowingly move an infected dog um, that is sick, um, that is not legal. Um, but we would never be able to enforce that, I think, really, realistically. So um, if your dog was under, let's say for argument's sake, your dog is positive, um, is undergoing treatment, is going well, um, you want to move to Alice Springs or something um, or vice versa, there would be no issue um, moving them. It, it's um, You don't need to report it to anyone. There's only one state where you have to actually make a declaration and that's into Tasmania if you're moving a dog to Tasmania. Yep. And my final question, is there any risk of introducing the, uh, the tick through tourists and dogs and their dogs into new places? We are concerned about that. So um, particularly as people have been heading north in the, I, I guess the tick season is sort of, at the moment, it's, oh, there's definitely cases up in Northern Territory now, and we've got cases coming through that are positive detections, um, but it's not the peak of the tick season. I think that will be in the wet. Yeah. Um, but yes, I think as tourists are returning from Northern Territory with their dogs, um, it's quite possible they will be introducing it further south. So my concern would be into those warmer areas. I don't know, you know, possibly Port Augusta, um, but Lee Creek, Creek and Roxby and places like that where people have got um, dogs that run around a lot and there's lots of dogs coming in and out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Nah. Well, thank you very much. Space. Yeah. Well, we got there in the end. We and got there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So apologies for the internet issues. Nah, so, right. um, okay. Well, and I'm very happy to, um, if you if you do get questions from people, I'm very happy to answer them. Yeah, um, we'll definitely forward them can, on. Yeah, yeah, and no, I'd be more than happy to um, answer them. So no it's worries. all good. Thank you. Okay, so I'll um, leave it there. Yep. Okay. <laughs>